So the New Testament reading for today is from John chapter 12. We're going to be reading verses 1 through 16. Uh, This section of John starts on page 898 in your pew Bible. Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave him a gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at the table. Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, he who was about to betray him, said, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Jesus said, leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. The poor you always have with me, but you do not not always have me. When the large crowd of Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came, not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priest made plans to put Lazarus to death as well, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it was written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples do not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The word of the Lord. As we listen to all those many prayer requests, we are reminded that this is a world full of sorrow and difficulty and even death. What hope is there except for our Lord Jesus Christ? Which is why we are here this morning to be fed once more by him and by his word. And before I do so, um, I want to also bring you greetings from our officers retreat yesterday where the elders and the deacons gathered to pray for one another and talk about where the Lord is bringing our church and to let you know that we prayed for uh, each one of you if you are a member or a regular attender here we tried to lift up each one of you by name and although we talked about various things about our worship services and how we can be more welcoming to people from a variety of backgrounds and how maybe to become more of a church family between you know townies and gownies and that sort of thing what we all determined by the Holy Spirit's guidance is that this next year will be a year of prayer. We have been very word-centered in many ways, and that can yet feed our pride, and yet, at least as your pastor, I can tell you that I have not been dependent upon God enough and His Holy Spirit to strengthen the ministry of the Word, uh, to humble ourselves before Him, to ask Him to use us to grow in godliness as well as for His kingdom, and we need your help. It's not just something elders and deacons do, it's what the body of Christ does. If you can teach us how to pray, we invite you to do that. And we'll be hearing more from us as far as suggestions from us as how we can do that. So let's do that right now before we hear God's word. God, we come to to think about the story which our brother Kyle just read to us, but that is ultimately from you. And so we pray that this would be a spiritual time. I come, Lord, preaching not with words of eloquence or human wisdom, but with much fear and trembling and asking for you to make this time worthwhile for your sake, for your purposes, and we ask it in the name of our Lord Christ. Amen. Do you ever feel that you get overzealous about certain matters? How about, for instance, just say, sporting events? I spent years going to my girls' soccer games, and let's just say I was not always moderate in my expressed opinions. One time in particular, I remember, we were at the old Bill Brown Stadium, which has now been torn down there, the old uh, 
old middle school site in Blacksburg. And my daughter, Geneva, was playing a particular game, and the referee made a very confusing call that we all disagreed with. And so I simply shouted out, Ref, what was that? We are perplexed. <laughs> Mortifying my daughter. Another game in Roanoke, it got so bad that the opposing, and these are teenage girls, mind you, and the, the opposing team's goalie shouted out, somebody shut that man up. <laughs> At which point, I promptly shutted myself up. Her plea had an answer. And that is often the case, uh, except this last fall, I was given tickets through my friend Don Weyburn to go to the uh, Virginia Tech UVA football game. But because they came to us free, gratis, it was in the UVA parents section and very good seats. If you know Lane Stadium, or Lane Temple, as I fondly call it, fondly call it the, the opposing team section is this very narrow section on one side of the stadium, but we are in the third row of that game, and they're therefore surrounded by the most adamant UVA parents. And if you remember how that game went, it did not go well for them, did it? As I remember the score, it was something like 55-10, and most of those 10 points scored by UVA were in the very last few minutes. It was not a fun game for the UVA parents to watch. And so even though I had a VT hat on, there I was surrounded by these parents that loved their kids, these wonderful families from Richmond or Virginia Beach that sent their boys to a wonderful school. And I hate to break it to you, but UVA is a pretty good school, y'all. And there they were, just rooting on for their boys. Of course, I was rooting for Virginia Tech, but it kind of, you know, put things in perspective. It was just football. And there's more important things than winning a game, things like family and love for your children and that sort of thing. Have you ever been overzealous and realized maybe it was out of place? Well, what about Mary here in our passage? Should she have been more moderate when she poured out a whole jar of perfume upon the Lord Jesus Christ? Is Judas right about this? The context of the story, of course, is that Jesus has just raised Lazarus from the dead as the great capstone of his earthly ministry, proving that he is, in fact, God in the flesh, God come to restore and redeem this world, here to bring life to all those who would trust in him and life forevermore. What great news this is. But you also know that in order for that to happen, it came at a great price. Jesus first has to enter into Jerusalem to die a sacrificial death for the sins of his people. And that is what chapters 12 through 19 of John are all about. These last eight chapters approximately, almost half of the gospel, are the very last earthly week of Jesus' life. This is what historically the church has called Holy Week. And yes, if you are a stickler for the liturgical calendar, we are a few weeks off since Easter this year is in April. Uh, we're talking about Palm Sunday already. But, you know, this is what we do here at Grace Covenant. We're always a little bit off on everything. But really, it just has to do with our philosophy of going through a book verse by verse, wherever it takes us, and this is where we are. However, this morning, we're really just going to focus on the first eight verses and skip verses 9 through 11, because we talked about those for a long time last week, and then just barely get into his triumphal entry, if we even get there. And so, yes, we're delaying Palm Sunday for a couple of weeks, if that makes you some of you happy. And so John begins this Holy Week in chapter 12 and verse 1, six days before the Passover on which Jesus will be betrayed and turned over to the Gentiles to be killed. Jesus therefore came to Bethany where Lazarus was whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So you might remember that Bethany was just outside Jerusalem, just two miles out, really a suburb, and this is where Lazarus and Martha and Mary lived. And so just one week before he dies for the sins of the world, there is Jesus having fellowship around the, uh, the dinner table with his dear friends. And there is Lazarus, who once was dead, now eating with his God there at the same table. You see what a lovely picture that is? It's really the same picture that 
we read about in Revelation chapter 3. You know this, where Jesus knocks at the door. But we, we always take that verse out of context. We think it's about evangelism. But this is, this is what John writes to us in Revelation chapter 3. Jesus says, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. Oh, that sounds kind of harsh, right? Jesus is here to, to make us repent. And then he says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. And so Jesus is here in our lives. He loves us so much that he works discipline and holiness in our lives. But the purpose is not to knock us down. The purpose is so that God himself can eat with us and have fellowship with us. That's what heaven's going to be like. It's unbelievable that we get to do that forever with our God. And so then, of course, we read in Revelation 19 about the great marriage feast of the Lamb, that heaven is pictured this wonderful feast with God and all of the saints forever and ever and ever. And so that is the end result of Jesus going to the cross and rising from the dead. It's so important that we remember this because these next few chapters are going to be filled with sadness and sorrow and difficulty and a cross. But the ultimate end is so that we would then be lifted up out of all that, to be with God forever and with all of those we love. There is hope after this world. That is why we are here this morning, to remember that hope, to strengthen us, to keep following after Christ, even as he works holiness and discipline in our lives, which is not always fun. And you may have noticed this small detail in verse 2 that they are reclining at the table. You probably know in the ancient Middle East, the tables were on the floor, and when people sat down, they kind of just laid down so their, their feet were sticking out. It was very chill looking, really. That's just what they did. And so that leads to the next part of the story, which is the main event of the meal. Look at verse 3. Mary, therefore, took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair, the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. This is a remarkable act of worship that Mary gives to her Lord Jesus Christ. First of all, a pound, or just even translated here, that's about 12 ounces. That was a lot of perfume, right? I mean, can you imagine putting that amount of perfume on? I don't use this stuff. I don't even use aftershave. Every year in my stocking, there's aftershave that I never touch. Santa hasn't gotten the message. But, any, but some of you use it, but I, what, I've seen it on TV. You just put a little dab on, if you have perfume, on your wrist or your neck and just a little aftershave. What, why would you pour a whole pound? This is extravagant. And it's so extravagant that John says it fills the whole room with the scent. That's also a beautiful picture, isn't it? Her worship of Christ filling the room. This is what we're doing here this morning. The, we want the, the scent of Christ, the aroma of the gospel and his goodness and his beauty to flow through this place, to flow through our veins and then flow out into the world. It's all about the beauty and the glory and the majesty of Jesus Christ. And we get our problems and our struggles and our weakness get lost in his beauty. We are strengthened by him. We are those that know we are weak. And so unite ourselves to the Son of God for our sakes. It's what Paul writes in 2 Corinthians. Uh, he says that we, thanks be to God who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession. This is, oh, if you know Paul, he knows his weaknesses. We're being led in triumphal procession and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of Christ everywhere. We are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved. This is a picture that John is showing us and what Mary did for Christ. And more than all of this, besides the, the quantity that she poured out upon him, it was a very rare and expensive perfume. Uh, G, John tells us that it was a pure nard. And there's some you know, scholarly debate about exactly how to translate this phrase. But something that seems very clear is that it was a rare perfume from the, the, the nard plant, that's what that word means, that came all the way from India. Oh, do you imagine that? I mean, this was before there was FedEx or UPS, this imported oil. And she takes it all and she pours it out upon Christ. Again, it's a beautiful picture of, of Jesus being anointed by oil from distant Gentile lands because he is their savior too. Just like at his birth, gifts were brought to him in the, at, in the stable 
so now he is being anointed by the oil from the far reaches of the world. And in fact, this perfume was so rare and expensive that Judas tells us accurately, as far as we know, that it could have been sold for 300 denarii. And since our footnote tells us that a denarii is about a day's wage, this is like a year's worth of income poured out on this, in this one instant, upon Christ. And so Judas complains, this is too extravagant, too costly to waste in this one useless thing. Why do this? And we'll talk about his uh, motivations in a moment. But for now, just notice that Jesus says, yes, it is in fact worth that much. And what Mary has done is a beautiful, faithful thing. Because notice what she then does. She doesn't just pour it out and then leave. She doesn't just say, here, Jesus, have a gift, and then I'm going to go fix some food. She then wipes it with her own hair. I mean, weren't there towels around? Why is she using her own hair? Doesn't she know this is the Son of God right in front of her? And yes, she does. He just raised her brother from the dead. She knows exactly who he is. I mean, if Jesus were, were physically right here in the room in, in bodily form, I would be like maybe a firm handshake if I dared that. Maybe an A-frame hug, as I call it, you know, nothing too affectionate. But here is Christ allowing his sister in the Lord to anoint him with oil and to wipe it with her own hair. This is the kind of God we have in Christ. He's our Lord and our King, but somehow he is also our best friend and draws close to us and loves us and wants us to, to know and, and embrace him that way. What is holding you back from doing that? Why are you keeping Christ at arm's length? Are you scared of his judgment upon you? If you have trusted him, there is no more judgment. He knows everything about you. Come and rush into his arms. The only thing to be scared of is if you are not confessing something, if you are staying away from him, if you're trying to still pretend like you're a good person, then in fact you are exalting yourself and you will be humbled. But if you humble yourself and come to him with everything that's going on, he wants nothing but to embrace you and to eat with you. He's knocking at your door, believer. Let him in. Dine with him. He has nothing but goodness and love and grace and kindness for you. So now let's look then at Judas's objection, who doesn't get this at all. Look at what Judas says in verse 4. Judas Iscariot, one of Christ's disciples, who was about to betray him, said, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? And then John tells us he said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was there. And so there's all sorts of reasons why Judas probably said this. First of all, the one that John just tells us in verse 6, he was a thief. So even though he was in charge of the, they would, you know, this is an example for us as well. As Christ is going around, they would collect money for the poor as part of their ministry. Yes, Jesus could do miracles, but they also financially took care of people. And so apparently Judas used to skim some off of the top. And he can literally smell his stealings going away through this, this wasted opportunity to help himself. Now, how John knows this, we don't know. Maybe after Judas's suicide, they did an accounting of the books and realized some was missing. Maybe John knew all along and just thought, it's okay, Judas is here in the realm of grace and in time he'll figure out and repent and he didn't have the courage to confront him. We don't know, but this was one of Judas's motivations. Second, it is very likely that Judas is offended that Jesus is getting this kind of attention and worship. After, he's about to betray Christ. He's never been converted. There he is in the inner circle of the church, but he's never been born again inwardly. And so for some reason, having seen all the good that Jesus has done, he thinks it's, Jesus is just one more man. And so this kind of extravagant worship is idolatrous. It's wasteful. But if Jesus is God in the flesh... How much money is too much to spend on Christ? There can be no measure. Jesus deserves everything we have. It shows Judas' lack of respect for Christ's majesty. That's the same way some unbelievers will not understand your devotion to Christ and that you come here on Sunday morning, for instance, or, or that you're going on a missions trip instead of going to the beach, although Deacon's doing both. Uh, but that, anyway... 
right? They won't understand. Why are you spending your time on that? Thanks for letting me pick on you. Uh, <laughs> Judas does not understand why Mary would be so devoted to this man because she, he does not understand that Christ is God. But then third, and this is what's most interesting to me, notice Judas's utilitarian argument. He says this perfume is kind of just useless of itself, so it should have been sold for money, and then that money given to buy food or something useful for the poor. That's what he's saying, at least. So he's saying, really, just the idea of perfume is wasteful in that light. I mean, how many of you this morning are wearing ties? Just raise your hand. Don't, I'm wearing it, so just join me in our, our extravagant wastefulness here. My sister gave me this when I was in high school. She got it from a thrift store somewhere. I don't know. 50 cents she spent on it. Wasteful. It's not needed. How many of you are wearing necklaces? Those of you that thought you escaped that barb. Okay. <laughs> not needed. You all are adding a useless amount of beauty to the world. You, you, you see? You, 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 you see no, no, no. You see, that's what, Je, that what Judas is saying. Why pour some perfume out? on a man instead of spending it in a utilitarian fashion. Yes, we can approach life that way, and then everything will be about food and shelter, and life just becomes drab. C.S. Lewis actually encounters this argument in an essay he wrote called Learning in Wartime, which was, of course, written during World War II when all of the West was militarizing itself to, to save civilization against the Nazis and others. And Lewis says, well, should we then spend any time in university? Should professors still be professors writing books and poetry? Or shouldn't everybody be on the front line? And he says, if we're trying to save civilization, there needs to be a civilization that is saved. That's what we're doing. Yes, life is about helping those in need and making sure basic needs are taken. But life is also about what is good and true and beautiful. And that is what Mary is doing here. She is saying, my Lord Jesus is the most beautiful thing in all of creation, and I am going to show that. See, look at what Jesus says about Judas' argument in verse 8. He says, the poor you will always have with you, but you do not always have me. Now, of course, Jesus is not saying that we should not take care of the poor. We've already shown that they were taking care of the poor in his earthly ministry. And if you know, the, uh, just read Matthew 25 to, to read what Jesus says we ought to do for the poor. And if you know the rest of the New Testament, you know that was a vital part of the church's mission, to take care of the poor within their midst, to take care of believers that had trusted Christ. You know, so many of the letters are written about taking care of the poor as part of their application. But Jesus is saying this is a special time. There's only one time in human history where God came to earth in the flesh. And yes, a year's wages would have done the poor a lot of good, but not as much good as his death and burial and resurrection, which saves souls for eternity. So shouldn't that be marked in some way? Isn't that appropriate? And so if you think about it, because Christ died for the sins of the world, and his Holy Spirit has converted people, and now his body is filling the world through the church, and the gospel is being preached. In the last 2,000 years, how much money do you think the church has spent on the poor? I can guarantee you it's way more than a year's wages. It's incalculable, but none of that would have occurred had Jesus not come to earth as our Savior. And surely some valuable gift is allowed to be set aside to mark and honor him. And so here's, I think, the other thing about Judas's petty criticism that we can, I think, note and apply to ourselves. And the, that fact is simply this. It wasn't his perfume. This was Mary's perfume. And so she's allowed to spend it for God's glory as she sees fit. This is the doctrine that we call the doctrine of Christian freedom. God gives to each one of us a certain amount of gifts and resources by his sovereignty. And it is up to us with prayer and guidance and discretion and wisdom, it's up to us to decide how to spend our money, our time, and our gifts for his glory. I heard one preacher put it like this. You are free to choose the good that you want to do. 
You are free to choose the good that you want to do. Now, of course, it has to be good. You can't spend your money or your time on sin, right? It has to be something worthwhile and good. But whether you give to this particular missionary or another, whether you give to that secular charitable cause or another, or whether you go on this retreat or, uh, or no retreats at all, that is up to you. And it's the only most the critical, most kind of believer that will criticize one another for not spending our money and our time in the way they think we should. You see that? It shows a smallness of soul. It shows a self-righteousness that we would look at someone else's life and criticize the good that they are doing just because it's not the good that we would choose to do. I have a silly story that, um, that reminds me of this principle from my life. As I think about this story, it's probably the least profound story I will ever share with you. But I had just graduated from college, and I was going into the Army, into the Medical Service Corps, and I was getting my uh, tags for um, my new car that my dad had bought me with my own money, but that's a whole other story. Um, anyway, um, and I just was excited to go into the Medical Service Corps of the Army, and the, the city I had graduated from college in North Carolina was Durham, which had a lot of hospitals. So I, as I was at the DMV, there was a little plate I could put on the front of the car because there was no need for a front license plate in North Carolina back then. And it just said Durham, North Carolina, medical capital of the nation or something like that. Probably a, an, an unwarranted boast, but it sounded good and I was excited about it. And I spent $4 and put it on the front of my car. Well, a friend of mine, a good friend of mine, was in Christian ministry at the time. And he said, why'd you buy that? And how much was it? I said, it's $4. And he said, what a waste of money. You should have given that to my ministry. Now, I've looked at that story. I don't know why I remember that story. I told you it was terribly unprofound. But I have done far worse than that. Things where I've criticized the way other believers have spent money that I'm just too embarrassed to tell you about. Because I have a critical heart. So here is the point. You can be critical of how you spend your own money. But let others serve God with their gifts as they see fit. They're following their conscience. They're doing what they think is best. Trust that God will use that. It's hard to do because you're always, right, if you're like me, you're always the smartest one in the room and you always know what's best. No. Let them have their freedom to serve God the way they see fit. And you say, well, what about the rich? Shouldn't they give more? Well, yes, they should, but you don't get to tell them how much more because the scriptures don't. And this is what Paul writes to Timothy towards the end of his life as he's giving him instructions for the church. As for the rich in the present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasures for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. You see that? He says they are to be rich in good works, to be generous, ready to share. But what percentage should their extra generosity take? Paul does not say that is between them and the Lord. And here is the thing. God does not need their money anyway. When we give, it is an act of worship and must be freely given and that's why we are told God loves a cheerful giver. He does not need our money. We do it because we love him. He does not need our gifts. Believe it or not, he does not need you. And so what we do, we do out of free worship for him because we love him. And so you see the point here. Mary is doing this beautiful thing to honor Christ with her perfume. It's her choice, her sacrifice of money. And Judas is showing an ugliness of his soul by criticizing her for pouring out her love upon our Savior. This reminds me of the way, if you might remember the story from 2 Samuel 6, where Michal criticized David when David brought the ark into Jerusalem. And David is so excited that he starts dancing and even takes off his shirt and is dancing around. Look, just because Michal did not want to rock out that way didn't mean David couldn't. And so it's with us. Listen, we may not all serve God in the same ways. We have to follow our own conscience and do what God calls us to do. Some of you may like to sway and raise arms when you sing. Uh, others are pretty happy to keep your hands in your pockets. Thank you very much. 
Some of you may like to wear witness wear, you know, the t-shirts and the hats with Jesus all over them. Others of you wouldn't be caught dead in that. Some of you may be passionate about a particular ministry or retreat that you're going on and you want everyone to jump on board, but others of you are called to a quieter ministry. Mary is pouring out her heart to Christ in worship. And whenever we see another believer doing that, we should rejoice at that. You see, I have a hard time doing that, especially when I look at other churches and I, some of the, what I think are the silly things they do. If they are doing it from a good heart, we should rejoice along with them. And so you also not only should avoid criticizing others as they pour out their hearts to God, you should also feel this freedom, like Mary took, to, if you will, to waste all sorts of gifts on God's glory, no matter what other people think, if you follow me. You see what Mary does here? It makes no sense from a worldly point of view, does it? Really, does it? To pour out a year's amount of, of, of wages on a one momentary act of worship? But we don't always have to be utilitarian and calculating in the way we serve God. Have any of you ever written a poem or a song or a journey entry that only you and God know about? Why not if you haven't? Or have you ever, when you're singing, just sung out with all of your heart and with all gusto, not caring what anyone else thinks? Maybe not every song, because then it gets kind of obnoxious. Just ask those around me. The, but have you ever just said, I am here to worship God? Or what about your daily work? Why do you do your daily work? Can you do your spreadsheets to the glory of God alone? Do you do your homework just to please God? I mean, we complain about having to work in cubicles or being grad students. But what does Paul tell slaves? What if you are an actual slave where you didn't have your freedom, made to do manual labor against your will? Paul says, bond servants, Obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would Christ, not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bondservants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not as to man. Knowing that whatever good anyone does, that he will receive back from the Lord whether he is a bondservant or free. Paul tells us, whatever, whether we eat or drink or whatever we do, do it all for the glory of God. Or I love the way the author of Ecclesiastes puts it. Go, eat your bread with joy. Drink your wine with a merry heart. For God is, oh, I love this, God has already approved what you do. You don't have to do your work to make God happy with you. You're already saved in Christ. So just enjoy it. Let your garments be always white. Let not oil be lacking on your head. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. That is how we honor God with our lives. We're like Mary. Mary is an example for us. We pour out our hearts to God. We do it to worship him no matter what the world may think. And in my own profession, I've, I heard a story that has helped me at least. And I heard it said that Martin Luther, the great German reformer, said that if he wrote a sermon and nobody showed up at all to the service, he would still preach it to an empty room to the glory of God because he's doing it for God. And I think that is what Mary is doing here. She's honoring her Lord no matter what anyone else thinks. And at the same time, here's the thing. We have to be careful about this. Do not hear me saying that you ought to go out and do something so radical and so stupid it's going to ruin your life. And for you college students, don't go doing something that would dishonor your parents or without getting them advice, especially if they're still paying for your school. This is what Paul tells us a radical life in service to Christ should look like. He tells us in 1 Thessalonians 4.11, Make it your ambition. There's your, there's your life goal. Make it your ambition, your vision statement, to mind your own business, to work with your hands, and to lead quiet lives. For me, the struggle to pour out my heart to God is that daily putting one foot in front of the other every day, being faithful with the small things. It's not, I'm, oh, I'm going to make, see, I'm not going on a missions trip, so I can make, it's not going out and changing your life radically. 
It's being faithful with the small things even when you don't want to. That is a way of picking up your cross and following after Christ. What is holding you back from that? That is the real struggle. What are you scared of? What are you holding back from the honor of Christ in your life? Maybe there is something radical you need to change. Maybe there is some sin you haven't confessed. Uh, some, some activity you're taking part of that you need to come to a brother and sister and let go. But maybe it's just worried that Christ will not accept you. He has already accepted your work. So go hard after him every day, step after step, serving him in the small things, and you will be rewarded. And still we have not answered the question, and here we will close, I think, before we even get to the triumphal entry much. Why did Mary use oil or perfume to anoint her Lord? Well, you may know that oil was an important symbol in the Old Testament, that priests were anointed, kings were anointed. The Old Testament talks about oil uh, dripping down beards as a sign of wealth and blessing. I mean, they, back then, instead of having fancy ties or necklaces, they had dripping beards. That's how people knew you were rich and happy. You'd come to church with your beard dripping. Thank you that you don't do that here. But the, that was what it stood for back then. And so obviously this is part of what's going on here, probably what Mary intended, and yet Jesus tells her that something even deeper is going on than that. Look at verse 7. Jesus says, leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. Now the, the Greek here is notoriously hard to translate. Uh, that's, you know, she's evidently already poured out the whole vial so what does he mean for her to keep it uh, that's why there's a footnote that says that she had intended to keep it for her burial but just couldn't hold back she loved him so much I think that's very possible uh, some commentators think Jesus is saying let her don't criticize her let her keep this honor of being the one who prepared me for my burial if so that would fit exactly with Mark chapter 14 in which Jesus says wherever the gospel is preached she will be remembered and honored for this, which is what we're doing this morning. 2,000 years later, we're honoring Mary's faith. See, she probably, as far as we know, did not know why he had come to Jerusalem, that she was coming to die, he was coming to die for the sins of the world. But in the same way, earlier in the chapter, Caiaphas, the high priest, prophesied that Jesus was dying for the nation, so is she of honoring Christ, worshiping Christ, and yet doing something deeper. Here he is, sitting with his best friends on earth, having dinner with them. And yet there, in just a few days, to die for their sins so that they could be with him forever. That is how much he loves them. He loves them to go all the way to the cross. She is preparing him to be buried so that her sins could be forgiven. That is what the triumphal entry is all about that we'll spend more time on in the future weeks. Here we see Christ entering into Jerusalem, praised by his people, hailed as the Savior, hailed as the King, and yet he is coming to be not just their King, but to be the sacrifice for their sin. That the way up, the way glory, is all the way down to the cross for our Lord and Savior. And so we began by this service by, by praising God that today is the day of salvation. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Why? Because Jesus is the stone that the builders rejected. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in his eyes. This is why we worship Christ. This is why we give him all. This is why we do not hold back from him any recess in our hearts. We have nothing to fear from Christ. Nothing to fear from our God. Our enemies are the devil and our own flesh and the world that is out there. Not our God. So let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, casting aside the sin and the doubt that so easily entangles, fixing our eyes on Christ, our friend, our Lord, our God, the author and finisher of our faith, the God who comes to knock on the door 
and enter in and sit down and eat with us. Let's pray together. Our Lord God, we do thank you for our older sister Mary. We thank you, Lord, that throughout the scriptures we see some of the greatest faith in our sisters, in those that were, did not hold back, those that did not worry about what the world thinks. We thank you for Mary pouring out her, her wealth, her heart, to worship and honor her Lord Christ. And we pray that we would do the same. Thank you, Jesus, for all that you do for us. Thank you for being our God, for being our friend, for being our strength, for being our shield, for being our captain, for being the one that embraces us. And oh, we look forward to that day when we shall see you face to face. Give us strength to follow you. Help us to shake off our fears, the things that hold us back, the, the fears of the world, the fear of man, the petty sins that we hold on to. Let us run into your arms. Would you work your holiness and discipline in our lives? Because you love us and so that we may have more of you. We ask this in your name and for your honor and glory. Amen.